I will never leave you or forsake you. For God so loved the world. Love is patient, love is kind. I can do all things through Christ. Put on the full armor of God. Well, what is up, Valley? What's going on, guys? Glad to have you with us this morning. Everyone who's joining from online, glad that you can come and worship, study God's Word with us together. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin. I am the Student Ministries Young Adult Pastor here, and uh, excited to have the opportunity to teach this weekend to continue in our summer playlist series and kind of what this series is about is us going and looking at some, some passages, some verses in the Bible that are really well known, that are really famous, that uh, because of that, sometimes whenever we, we know it, we've heard it before, we tend to think that we kind of move on uh, from it. And, and, and I don't think that that's, God's word is really something that we move on from, but it's something that we continue to study, continue to learn from. And so I'm excited to have this series coming back to some of these verses. Today we're talking about John 3.16, so probably the most famous verse that's ever been written in the Bible. And so... Uh, I'm excited for us to be able to, to dive into it today. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you are a God who, um, who, who we can know, who, who, who you speak to us, you move in our lives. You're not some far off distant God. And uh, as we come here to just study your word this morning, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would teach us uh, more about who you are. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's been a few months ago now that I would first get the news that my daughter's school would be uh, closing for in-person school services indefinitely, and we would eventually find out it would be for the rest of the school year. I have two younger boys who, who are in daycare. They're able to continue going to their daycare, but uh, my daughter who's sick, she was in kindergarten. We're now going to have to keep her home. And I remember me and my wife were like, man, what in the world are we going to do? My wife was able to continue working. I was able to continue working but have kind of a, a little bit of a flexible schedule. And so I say, you know what, I'll, I'll keep her. I'll either bring her to work with me or I'll, I'll, I'll stay at home with her on Sundays. And if you uh, know my daughter, my daughter is a huge just ball of energy. This, this chick is wild, all right? And so I remember just being like, I don't, I don't know if the house is going to survive, like the house is going to be destroyed at the end of this. I don't know how I'm going to survive being stuck at home every single day with my daughter all day, every day. And so I, I immediately start thinking like, what are we going to do? How are we going to stay entertained? And so the very first day I go to Walmart, I get a couple basketballs, I get a volleyball, and I say, hey, we're going we're gonna to work on some sports. We're going to get outside, we're going to do some things. And I love basketball. Basketball has always been a passion of mine. And so every day I say, hey, Ella, let's, let's go shoot some ball. Let's go play basketball. And she'd be so excited. She'd get out there, and we'd practice for 20 or 30 minutes. And whenever we first started, she could, like, barely dribble. Like, she'd dribble, and it'd hit her foot and go way over there. Or she'd be like, oh, watch this, I can dribble. And she would just throw it down and then catch it, and then throw it down and catch it. She's like, I'm dribbling. And I'm like, that's not dribbling. That's not how that works. Um, she, she couldn't really shoot the ball that well. Wasn't, was, wasn't very good. She had just started practicing, and we would practice a little bit every day, and she starts getting to where she can dribble the ball pretty well. She starts getting to where she can shoot, where she can pass, and, 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 and just getting better and better, and uh, it was a lot of fun. That lasted a whole three days, all right? And three days later... <laughs> Three days later, I'm like, Ella, let's go shoot basketball. And she says, no, I already did that. I'm like, what do you mean you already did that? It's, it's something you keep doing. It's something you keep working on. You keep practicing. You've been getting so good at dribbling. Let's go out there and let's dribble. And she says, but daddy, I can already dribble. You saw it. I dribbled, I dribbled 100 times. I just sat there. I dribbled. I can dribble. I said, yeah, but, but, but you got to get better. You got you to keep practicing. Let's go work on your shooting. And she says, but I already made the shot. Like, you already made the shot. Like, that's what, what basketball players say. Oh, yeah, I already made a shot. I'm good. Like, I'm just going to retire now. I'm done. I'm like, it's something that you keep working on. The greatest basketball players, man, they, they come back and they work on the fundamentals and they work on their basics and they come back over and over because that's how you grow in something. And I think that sometimes we have the same thought process with the Word of God. We say, well, I've already heard that verse. I've already 
read that passage. I've already heard a message on that idea, and so it's not something that I need to go back to, but, but, but I'm good. I can kind of move on from there, but, but, but whenever we do that, we forget God's Word is living and active. It continues to work in our lives. It continues to shape our lives and to teach us. We're humans. We forget things, so whatever it is that you learned, whether you read that verse a year ago or a week ago, there are going to be things about it that you're going to forget, and so it's important for us to come back and to be reminded of it. As you go through life, a certain verse, the way that it would apply to your life five years ago is going to be different from the way that it's applied to your life now or in the next five years. And so it's not something that we move on from, but that we continue to come back to and to grow in. Bruce Lee once said, he was one of the greatest martial artists of all time, he said, I fear not the man who's practiced 10,000 kicks one time. But I fear the man who's practiced one kick 10,000 times. And, and the idea behind that is you can know 10,000 kicks. You can know spinning back kicks, cartwheel, all the, you know, all these different kind of kicks. But if you practice them one time, you have a very basic understanding. You're at a very rudimentary level of how you can apply that thing. But if, if you take one kick and you practice and you study and you practice and you study and you implement over and over and over, he says that is going to be one dangerous dude. And I think that, that Scripture says, Sometimes we think, well, I know, I know this verse, and I know that book, and, I read, and we, see the, we see the Bible as something that we're trying to read through. I'm just trying to read through the Bible so I can know more Bible, but it's not about getting through the Bible. It's about allowing God's Word to get through us, and that happens whenever we slow down, and, and we find passages, and we find places of Scripture, and we say, what does God want to teach me? In this, And so today we're in John 3, 16. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn there with me. Uh, we're actually going to be starting in John 3, 14. <clears throat> but you can turn there to the third uh, chapter in the book of John. It's about three-fourths of the way through your Bible. Uh, start flipping to the right. You'll see a couple guys' names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. If you hit Acts or Romans, you've gone too far. But we're in John chapter 3, starting in verse four, uh, 14. I want to give you guys a couple um, of, of kind of what we're going to go through, what this is going to look like. First, I want to talk a little bit about the context of John 3.16. Uh, it's not a verse that just stands on its own. There's a lot of people who know John 3.16, but, but, but I wonder how many of us know John 3.17. How many of us maybe know John 3.15? Anything that happens in the third chapter of John, right? For us to understand like kind of where, where that comes from, why, what, what, what's happening around that, that statement that's made. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of things as I was studying this verse that kind of stood out to me as something new that I've taught this verse before, but this was kind of the first time of me seeing it um, in this way. And then kind of what I think the, the bigger picture, the main idea of, of John 3.16 is. And so the context behind it is, again, it's not that Jesus comes up on this mountainside and he's like, everybody listen up. I'm about to say John 3.16, and it's going to be the greatest words, the greatest verse. You're going, to, you're going to quote this for thousands of years, and they're going to put it on billboards, and Tim Tebow's going to put it on his eye black and wear it for football games, and everyone's going to go. Like, like, that's not how it happened. It happens in the middle of this conversation. At the beginning of John chapter 3, a guy named Nicodemus comes to see Jesus. And Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a teacher of the law. And he goes to see Jesus in the middle of the night because a lot of the, the Pharisees, they didn't like Jesus. He didn't want to be seen talking to Jesus. So he kind of sneaks there in the middle of the night. And, and he says to Jesus, like, hey, there's something different about you. Like, like, it is apparent that God is with you. And Jesus engages in this conversation with him. And he starts talking to him about salvation. And he says, Nicodemus, in order for someone to see the kingdom of heaven, they have to be born again. Born again. And Nicodemus is like, what in the world? Born again? I don't, I don't exactly know a lot about biology, but I understand you're born, you live, and you die. Like, what, but born again, what in the world are you talking about? And Jesus goes on to talk about that, 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 that salvation, it's not about becoming more moral. It's not about becoming more religious. It's not about becoming a better version of you, but it's about becoming a completely new you. It's about being born of the Spirit, that God would come and change your life. And he's, he's, he's entering into this conversation about salvation with Nicodemus and he gives him a reference in, in John 3 14 that immediately Nicodemus is going to know what he's talking about if you have your Bibles John 3 14 he says this just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life and to us, that's just like, man, that's a weird, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, what in the world is he talking about? Nicodemus immediately would have known. He's referencing Numbers 21. It's a story where God is using Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, out of slavery, 
to this new place that he's prepared for them, but because of the people's disobedience, their unwillingness to follow God, it takes 40 years. It's this, this, this journey of them getting to where God has prepared uh, for them. And so they're, they're complaining and they're criticizing God. And so God, in this chapter, he brings some discipline, he brings some judgment to his people in the form of a bunch of poisonous snakes. No joke, Numbers 21, go check it out. There's a bunch of poisonous snakes at them. And so a bunch of them get bitten, they start getting sick, and the people immediately go to Moses. They're like, Moses, 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 come here, come here, come here. We, um, we messed up, man. <laughs> this is not good, this is not good. Can you, can you talk to God? Can you please, can you get him to, to fix this, whatever? I don't know, can, can you just please talk to God? And so Moses goes, and he talks to God, and he's praying to God, and, and God says, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna take a stick, and then you're going to take some, some bronze and you're going to fashion that bronze into the image of a serpent. And you're going to take this snick and stick and you're going to put the serpent mounted on the stick just like this and you're going to raise it up. It's going to form this image of the, the English T. And everyone in the camp, they're going to come and they're going to look at it. Whenever they look at it, they're going to be healed. That's it. They don't have to say a prayer. They don't have, to, they don't have to do anything. They just have to come look at what I've done and they will be healed. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man, which is a reference to himself, must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, I, I, I've taught through John 3.16 before. I've heard a lot of people talk about John 3.16 and the kind of the first place that, that we tend to go is we say, okay, for God so loved the world. And, and we say that, you know, the, the world, it's not that God has this generic love for the world. It's not that this is some blanket statement that like, oh, God kind of loves everyone, but, but, but God loves you individually. God loves who you are and God's love speaks into your situation and into your experiences, into your life. And I think that that's absolutely true, but I also don't think that that's what this verse is talking about. For God so loved the world, for God so loved the cosmos, where we get the word cosmos, the idea of the universe, all of his creation, and not just all of his creation, but the order of his creation. And, and this calls us back to the creation story that in the beginning, God creates the stars, he creates the planets, he creates the, 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 the birds and the water and the mountains and everything, and it has this good creation. He calls it good. Page two of the Bible, he creates man in his image that, that exists perfectly with creation. It's this beautiful picture of us existing existing with, with, with animals and God's creation being, being good and perfect. And that's why anytime if, if you see Narnia or you see these books or these movies where people are interacting with, with animals and it's this, there's this peace between animals, there's, there's something in you that says, man, how incredible is that? How good is that? How awesome is that? Because that was God's original design for creation. In page three of the Bible, we mess that up. Sin enters into the world. There's brokenness. There's hurt. We start to see that there's, there's hurricanes and there's earthquakes and there's tornadoes and there's things that are wrong. God's good creation is now corrupted. Within us, humanity, we now have division. We have hate. We have anger. We have judgment. All of these things that exist in us. And, and, and God's story of redemption is for the cosmos, the entire world. Sometimes we see God's story of redemption is for my life. God wants to redeem my life. God wants to redeem your life. God wants to redeem all of his creation. Just a couple weeks ago, I was, I was camping with, with some friends and family, um, and we go on this hike, and at the end of the hike, there's this uh, waterfall, and my favorite thing, we, we go there once a year, and is, is to go and swim up under this waterfall, and there's this little rock under the waterfall that you can stand on, and I'm standing on it, and I just kind of lean out, and I just feel the weight of the water just coming down on top of me, and it's just so beautiful to think about God's good creation, and I jump in the water, and I see, I see fish swimming around, and under the water, you can see the, the turtle turbulence of all the, of the water under the surface, and God's redemption story is not just to redeem people's lives, it's to redeem the oceans, it's to redeem the stars, it's to redeem the universe, it's to redeem our planet, and it's such a beautiful picture that I want to remind you of, especially right now. Like, I think it's so clear how broken our world is, how messed up our world is, and God doesn't want to just come back and save people, but he wants to come back and redeem his entire creation. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whoever. And Jesus is going to use this, this word a couple of times. He's going to use whoever in the very next verse. He's going to use the word everyone a couple of times because who's he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisee. He's talking to Nicodemus. He's talking to a guy who thinks that salvation is for the Jews. Salvation, God's grace is for this group of people. God's love is for this group of people. And so Jesus is going to combat that. He's going to say, whoever believes in me. And Nicodemus is going to kind of cringe every time he hears that. And I think that we can do that sometimes. We can think that God's grace, God's love is for a certain group of people. We probably don't say that out loud, but it's kind of a thought process that we have, that God wants to save, God wants to love people who look like me, people who vote like me, people who have the same morals, the same standards, the same values as me. And Jesus comes over and over again. He says, this story of redemption, the object of God's love is extended to everyone. Whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And as I'm reading over John 3.16, and I'm reading through, through the third chapter of John and through the book of John, there's this one theme that keeps popping up. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God, and he is the way to salvation. In fact, in, in the Gospel of John, uh, Son of God is used 29 times. John is going to tell us in John chapter 20, Hey, this is why I'm writing this, this book. This is why I'm writing this gospel. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. He says that's, that's the whole point. That's why I'm writing. Is I want you to understand that Jesus is the Son of God and the only way to salvation, and that's the core, that's the center of the center of who we are as Christians. That's the foundation of our faith, that Jesus is God, and through him we can have eternal life. And I want to ask you a question. How do you know that? If that's the central truth of our faith, how are you so sure that Jesus is the Son of God? What evidence do you have for that? So I think a lot of us, we have this idea that, well, uh, my parents believed it, and so I believe it. Um, I've just always been a Christian, and so I just kind of believe that Jesus is the Son of God, or I don't know, I just, I just kind of believe because I've, just, I've always believed. I don't know. Jesus is the Son of God. And I think it's so important. If that's, if that's the center of what we believe and who we are, how important is it for us to actually know why? For us to actually be able to provide people with evidence for why we believe. Because that's a big claim. A Jewish carpenter 2,000 years ago was God in the flesh. There's a big burden of proof there. How are you so certain? How are you so sure that you're willing to base your life off of this truth? And so we're going to talk about that with the rest of our time. Some of the evidences um, for, for Jesus being God. And, and this is going to be directed at a couple different people. You can be in a couple different places. One... It's for a group of people, maybe you're like me, um, and you're very skeptical, and, and I'm a very skeptical person, and I've struggled with, with a lot of doubts about whether or not Jesus is God. I see all these different religions, all these different worldviews, and I kind of think, man, how, how am I sure, how am I certain that this is the one true religion, that Jesus is the way to salvation? As I read through the Bible sometimes, I'm like, man, how, how do we know this really happened? How do we know that this really is the truth? And that's me as a pastor Someone who teaches the Bible still have those doubts and still have those struggles. And so if you're someone out there who's a believer that, that still has doubts, I hope that this can be something that encourages and strengthens your faith. There's another group of people who, who, who maybe you're not sure what you believe about Jesus. And, and you came and you checked out this, this church thing because you think it's, it's good, it's the right thing to do, you wanted to do it, but you're still not totally sold out on who Jesus is. You're not certain about who he is, and I hope that this would give you some evidence and some reason um, for why we believe Jesus is the Son of God. And then there's a third group of people. Who you say, you know, I've never really had any doubts. I've never really had any struggles. I believe Jesus is, is God. I believe God is real, and that's never been an issue for me. And if that's you, you need to understand it's important for you to know this because there are going to be people in your life who do have doubts, who do have struggles. You may not have those questions, but your children will have those questions. Your grandchildren will have those questions. Coworkers, friends, people in your life are going to say, you know, I'm just not convinced. Why do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? What has convinced you? And I think it's so important for us to be able to give real evidence and real answers. And so for the first, the first evidence is that Jesus claimed as deity. If you have your note sheets, um, it's, the, it's the first point on there is that Jesus 
claimed his deity. And whenever I say deity, that just means his godness. And this is important because I don't know if you know this. There's a lot of worldviews that say, yeah, Jesus was just a guy. Sure, Jesus existed. He was a Jewish guy in the first century. He was probably a rabbi. He taught. He taught about love. He taught about peace. He taught about these. But God? I mean, come on. And there's a lot of different religions, there's a lot of different worldviews that will say, yeah, Jesus was a good guy, Jesus was a good teacher, but the claim that he was the son of God is something completely different that would say there's no evidence, there's no basis for that. A guy by the name of Bart Ehrman, he's a New Testament scholar, um, he's written a lot of books that, that some of them have encouraged my faith, um, supported my faith, many of them have, have challenged my faith in a lot of ways, um, but one of them is a book, How Jesus Became God. How Jesus became God, and, and, and it's about how um, Jesus didn't make the claims to be God, but, but, but years after his life, years after his death, people start kind of writing these stories about how he was God. He says this in his book, during his lifetime, Jesus himself didn't call himself God and didn't consider himself to be God. He continues, none of his disciples had any inkling that he was God. That's a New Testament scholar. That's someone who studied the New Testament scriptures over and over and over, and he makes a statement like that. We need to be able to, to, to say, we need to be able to show, no, 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 Jesus time and time again claimed exactly who he was, that he was God. If you have your Bibles, flip over to John 8 with me, John 8, 56. I think we're going to throw it up on the screen if you don't have your Bibles. 856, he, he's talking to this group of people, um, this, this, this group of, of Jewish religious leaders, and he says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And he makes this weird statement that Abraham, who lived a thousand years ago, was excited to think about the day that I would come and the day that I would walk earth. And people are like, what, what are you talking about? They say, you're not even 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham? Like, what are you talking about? And here's what Jesus says. I tell you the truth. Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. And he's not just saying, I existed before Abraham. Whenever he says, I am here, it is this reference to the name of God, that whenever God is telling Moses, hey, you're going to go, you're going to set my people free, Moses says, who do I say sent me? He says, tell them that, that I am that I am has sent you this idea that he is self-sufficient, that he exists outside of time. And so when Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am, everyone there knows exactly what he's saying, exactly who he's claiming to be. And as I was studying this, this passage, I see people who start to say, no, Jesus wasn't saying that. He didn't use exactly the right words. He wasn't claiming to be God. And I'm thinking, okay, what did the people that were there think? Continue reading. What happens? At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Everyone there was so convinced that he was claiming to be God that they pick up stones and they're ready to kill him. It doesn't just happen there, but it happens in John 10. Flip over to John 10, uh, starting at verse 24. Um, this is followed by some of the great I am statements. Jesus says these things like, I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am the way. I am the truth and the, and the life. I am uh, the bread of life. I'm all these different things that make salvation very exclusive to who he is. Verse 24, the Jews gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you. But you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my hand, out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This idea that, that they are of the same essence. And again, every single person there knows exactly what he's saying. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And I love Jesus' sass right here, Jesus' response. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? He says, I've healed the blind, I've healed the lame, I've done all these great miracles. Which one of those do you want to kill me for? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, Claim to be God. 
It's all over the Gospel of John, this idea of Jesus claiming to be God. And some people will say, well, that's just the Gospel of John, because that's John's point. John's point is that Jesus is the Son of God. And so they say, yeah, you see all this evidence in the book of John, but there's not really any in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. It's just kind of in this one place, and that's not true either. The Son of Man um, was a reference that he used earlier. I think it was in John 3, 14 or 15. He calls himself the Son of Man. That's going to be used 81 times in all of the Gospels, 30 specifically in the book of Matthew. And the book of Matthew is intended for, for Jews. It's kind of this very uh, Jewish audience-focused book. And so Jesus continuously refers to himself as the Son of Man. And whenever I was in, in high school and whenever I would read the Bible and see Jesus call himself the Son of Man, I'm like... That's cool. What the heck does that mean? Like, I get that you're a guy, you're a son, and your dad's a man, you're the son of man, but what, like, what, is, what does that mean? Like, there's no real significance. Why, why do you keep calling yourself that? And every time that he calls himself that, every single Jew there immediately knows it's a reference to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. This is where son of man, if you were wondering, you see that, you're like, what the heck, son of man? This is where it comes from. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. In my vision... At night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, which, by the way, that's my new favorite name for God. I'm not calling him God or Father anymore. It's Ancient of Days. It's a pretty cool name. And was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And it talks about this son of man who's going to be given all power, all authority, all people are going to worship him and to recognize him as the leader, that, that, that he is going to have this everlasting kingdom. What human could it ever be said of that they had an everlasting kingdom? None. It doesn't happen. But the Old Testament constantly talks about this idea of the Messiah who will one day come from the line of David, who will establish his everlasting kingdom. And so every Every time Jesus refers to himself as the son of man, which happens over and over and over, he is saying, I am more than just a person, I am more than just a teacher, I am more than just a good guy, but I am the son of God, I am the way to salvation. And lastly, he dies for it. He dies convinced that he is the way to be saved. He's in the garden and three times, is there any other way, is there any other way, is there any other way? And the father says, this is it. This, this, this is what has to happen. And so he goes to the cross because he understands that he's the only way to be, to, to, for the world to be saved. For, for us to, to have our sin paid for, it must be paid for by the blameless, spotless, sinless Lamb of God. He knows no ordinary person could do that. It has to be God. Jesus was absolutely convinced that he was the Son of God. And then lastly, um, there's this quote from from C.S. Lewis that I love. He says, it's from Mere Christianity. Uh, It says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and call him as as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, However strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Jesus was absolutely convinced that he was God. He lived a life believing that he was God, and he ultimately died because of his belief in God. Now, someone comes up to me and claims to be God, I'm like, whoopty, cool, very, very cool. Don't believe you. Right? It's got to be more than just that person, but there's a lot of worldviews that, that accept a lot of things about Jesus, but not his claim um, of being God. Another thing that we would expect to see is, is the second point. Jesus' closest followers affirmed his deity. Jesus' closest followers, the people closest to him, what did they think about who he was? Because the people closest to you know you in a, in a different way than everyone else does, right? 
Whenever my, uh, my wife and I, we, we first got married, she had a, an idea, a picture of the kind of husband that I'd be. She probably thought, oh, he's going he's gonna to be perfect. He's going to do the dishes, and he's going to do clothes. He's going to massage my feet. He's going to be this, this perfect husband, right? She has that picture, but it's, the more time she spends with me, the more time that, that we live together, she starts to see the flaws. She starts to see different things that I do horribly, how I leave my underwear on the floor, or, or my idea of, of cleaning, and, and these different things about me. And I can still be a great dad. I can still be um, a, a great husband. But she sees those flaws, and she understands that I'm not perfect. And that's all it takes for Jesus to not be God. He doesn't have to be a horrible guy. or a hor- He just has to not be perfect. Do his disciples recognize that? Bart Ehrman, again, he says his disciples had no idea. His disciples had no inkling that he was God. And initially, that's true. When Jesus first calls his disciples, he says, come on. Come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. They don't know what that means. He didn't sit down with them and talk theology and let me tell you about the, the incarnation and how I'm God. He doesn't do any of that. He just says, come and follow me. And there's this slow progress of them starting to learn who he is. It's in Matthew 8, one of my favorite stories. It's when they first start to really realize who he is. They're in the boat. There's this storm that comes, that hits. The water's coming over this boat, and they come to Jesus. Jesus, save us. Jesus, help us. And he, and he stands up, and he rebukes the storm, and the wind and the waves calm down, and they just look at each other. And they say, who is this man? What kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? But it's this journey. They have this great moment of, of recognizing who Jesus is. And then like the very next chapter, they doubt him. They're in a situation they're like, oh, all hope is lost. What do we do? They have no idea that the creator of the universe, the, the savior is standing right next to them. It's this up and down thing. There's then this culminating moment in Matthew 16 where Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, which is kind of this mecca of spirituality. There's all these pagan temples. There's this cave that's supposed to be like the tunnel to the, under, uh, the underworld. And, and it's this place of spirituality where you just kind of believe whatever you want. And Jesus takes his disciples there. And he uses that to set the stage. And he asks this question. Who do you think I am? You've been with me for three years now. You've seen my teaching. You've seen my miracle. Who do you think I am? And if there's any story in the Bible that I wish wasn't on paper but instead was on a flat screen, it would be this one. I want to know, man, Peter's going to speak up, but, but does he do it right away? Is there this pause? Is there that moment where everyone's just, they, they, they want to say it, they know what they're thinking, but they don't want to say it out loud because they don't want to look stupid? Man, there's so much buildup to who do you, it's been three years, who do you think that I am? And Peter says, I think that you're the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And it's this, just this incredible moment of yes. A couple chapters later, Jesus dies. And it's like, well, Peter, I guess you were wrong about that one. Because what happens? They're not hopeful after he dies. They're, they're done. They're like, this is over. We're going into hiding. Our leader's dead. This is over. And three days later, they see him, the risen Jesus, and it's at that point that there is going to be a new boldness. It is at that point that there is going to be a new courage. It is that point that there is no mistaking who he is. But whenever Jesus appears, he shows up to all the disciples except for Thomas. Thomas doesn't get to see Jesus. And so Jesus then leaves. They go to Thomas. Hey, Thomas, Jesus is back. He's alive. It's incredible. And he says, I don't believe it. There's no way. I'm going to have to see and touch him before I believe that he's actually back. And, and the way that Jesus has this next interaction with Thomas, if any of you struggle with doubt, if any of you struggle with skepticism, if any of you struggle with, with not being exactly sure, with doubting God at certain times in your life, I want you to know God does not meet your doubt with anger. He doesn't meet it with frustration. He doesn't meet it with condemnation. But in the same way that Jesus approaches Thomas and he says, Thomas, come and see, come and look, come and experience, come and touch. Jesus does the exact same thing in our lives. Do not be afraid to search. As Christians, do not be afraid of answers. I am so sick of hearing people say, well, if you knew what I knew, then you wouldn't be a Christian because I know all this stuff. False. The more that we learn, the more that we examine scripture, the more that we examine the life of Jesus, I believe the more and more you're going to be convinced of who he is. And just like Thomas, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And is that statement that truth that the disciples 
are going to be propelled into the book of Acts and the, and the coming of what's going to happen. They're going to be proclaiming and teaching the name of Jesus to the point to where they're going to be killed for it. Almost every disciple except for John is going to be killed because of their belief in Jesus. Peter is going to be crucified upside down. Uh, Paul is going to be beheaded under Emperor Nero. James is going to be stoned. Every single one of them. And now, now, because they were willing to die for that faith, that doesn't mean, ergo, Jesus was God. That means they were absolutely convinced that Jesus was God. All right? It wasn't, wasn't some lie. It wasn't some, if it's like, okay, Peter, you're about to die. You're about to be crucified upside down. And he knows it's a lie. He's like, hey, God's just joking. Got you. Jesus isn't God. There's no way. He was absolutely convinced. Jesus was willing to die because of his belief that he was God. His disciples were willing to die because of their belief that he was God. And then lastly is that Jesus' story has a worldwide impact. If God came to earth in the flesh, there would have to be some, some worldwide impact. There would have to be something more than just him and a small little group of people. All right, I had a student the other day who sent me a video of this person claiming they're like this prophet and they know all the end times, blah, 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 blah. The video has like 12 views. I'm like, okay, if this dude's a prophet, if this dude's been commissioned by God, why do only 12 people know about him? There's no way. Like, there has to be a significant impact in the world by someone who is the son of God. That's why whenever people say, well, how do you know Jesus is the son of God? There's this miracle worker over here, and there's this person in history over here who claimed they were God, and there's this Egyptian myth of this God over here. And I say, where's the evidence? Show me. Show me something more than some dot-com article that's based off of one piece of, of pottery that was found that's obscure and doesn't make any sense. Like, show me real evidence. Because whenever it comes to the claims of Jesus, whenever it comes to the claims of the New Testament, it's not just some book. It's a historical document. They are historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. You understand there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pages attesting to the life of of Jesus, and there are people who are textual critics that are not Christians that accept many of the books of the Bible. That's why whenever people are like, well, I don't believe in anything in the Bible, I'm like, textual critics who aren't Christians would say, yeah, Paul probably wrote this. This is probably accurate. This is probably history. And that's, that, that's what the Bible is, is, is it gives us accurate. We have information from the first century. We understand what the first century history looked like. And what took place is three days after Jesus dies, we see an empty tomb. We see his enemies are claiming, well, the Jews, his disciples stole the body. Someone must have stole the body. Well, that doesn't account for there's a group of 500 people who have claimed to have seen him. All of his followers have claimed to have seen him. All of these people who didn't really know Jesus are claiming to have seen a risen Jesus, and it spreads like wildfire, this, this story of the guy who defeated the grave, and it's the entire first century. It's not just this little small pocket of Christians, but the Jews, too. There, there's a Jewish historian Josephus and everything I'm about to say exists outside of the Bible. So again, people who are like, yeah, the Bible's garbage. There's, there's evidence for this outside of Scripture. Uh, Ju Jewish historian Josephus, who is first cent second century historian, um, talks about Jesus as this guy who did these, these great deeds, these great acts. We as Christians would call them miracles. He uses kind of this euphemism, but he says the Jews understood there's this guy named Jesus in the first century who did these, these great acts. The Jewish Talmud is a collection of Jewish writings and teachings that talk about Jesus as, as kind of a sorcerer because they knew that he did these great works, these great things, but they weren't sure that he was doing it by the power of God. So it depicts him as kind of this, this sorcerer. We have Roman historians, uh, Tacitus and Pliny the Younger, who write a lot of Roman history, which again, this is interesting. Some of the same people who write Roman history um, and that, that no one questions. No one questions Julius Caesar. No one questions Alexander the Great. No one questions the Gaelic Wars. They say, yeah, that happened. That's true. Some of the same people writing those things are talking about the Christ, talking about people who follow the way, who follow this guy who is claimed to be God, and they're persecuted for their faith, and they're not willing to, to, to offer incense and sacrifice to, to Caesar because they believe that Jesus is their God. And, and, and it's all over, man. It's not just this, this obscure guy with 12 followers, and he claimed to be God. Man, the entire known world at that time was impacted. And it wasn't just then, but it echoes into 2,000 years later. You look at a calendar, you open your phone, and, and, and what is it? It's 2020, 2020. Why? Did the world start 2,000 years ago? The time began to, no. 
What happened 2,000 years ago that was so impactful that time was split? What did a Jewish carpenter in the first century have to do to split time? The name of Jesus has power and authority today. That's something that, that, that we recognize, that it's either used as Lord or swear word. What other name has enough weight to be used as a swear word? None. But when people use it, it doesn't matter if they bow down to him, if they accept him as Lord, they use, because they understand that there is weight in the name of Jesus. And whenever we start to cumulatively look at these things, there is no one evidence. People all the time, oh, this evidence proves Christianity. This evidence disproves Christianity. No, you have to look at it all coming together as a whole. And whenever we look at Jesus was willing to die because of his belief that his, he was God, his disciples were willing to die for it, and it absolutely changes the entire known world at that time. And as I look at these things, man, I, I'm convinced every person has a decision to make. But I am convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. And, and it's John's whole point. He says this is everything. John 20, 31 again. This is, this is why he writes his gospel. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But there's more than just intellectually believing in him. There has to be a, a submission. There has to be an, an accepting, a following, a faith, a belief, a trust. And that but leaving, you may have life in his name. C.S. Lewis said that, I'll close with this, he said that uh, Christianity, if true, is of infinite importance. There's nothing that even comes close. If Jesus is the son of God, there's nothing that comes close to that truth. He says, if it's not true, then it is of zero importance, all right? If Jesus is not the Son of God, he was not raised from the dead, we are wasting our time. He says, the one thing that cannot be is moderately important. If Jesus is the Son of God, it is not something I add to my life. It is not something I do on the weekends. It is not just something I identify as. It's, 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 if Jesus is the Son of God, it means absolutely everything for my eternity, my family's eternity, and every single person who has ever walked this planet. John three seventeen is, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And if that story is true, nothing compares to that. No sport, no amount of square footage, no amount of money, nothing compares to Jesus. If Jesus is the Son of God and that story is true, it's everything. So as the worship team comes up here, we're going to um, sing one more song. We're going to worship. We're going to have a time of, of, of giving. There are some. We're not passing around um, our offering, but we do have some receptacles on the lobby um, as well as you can give online if you guys are watching online. So I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much <clears throat> that you've called us to love you with all of our hearts, souls, and, and minds. And, and sometimes we think that faith is leaving our brains at the door, checking our intellect at the door, and it's not. You've given us evidence. You've given us logic. You've given us reason. You've given us proof of who you are. And I pray that every single person here would, would examine those things. We would, we would inspect, we would look into this Jesus who claimed to be the Son of God. And if that is true, God, I pray that, that it would be more than just an intellectual belief, but that we would submit our hearts and all of our lives to you, and that you would just change us from the inside out. We love you, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.